In this episode of In Short Supply, we delve into the legacy of urban renewal and the complicated history of the Thames River apartments and affordable housing in New London, Connecticut. Urban Renewal and the Thames River Apartments. In the 1960s, New London had a dwindling tax base, a shrinking downtown retail center, and had undertaken an effort to reduce blight. The state had already claimed large swaths of land through eminent domain to make room for Interstate 95. The city's taxable properties list, which makes up the vast majority of its revenue base, was growing smaller, what with two college campuses and a hospital already located on tax-exempt land. Construction of I-95 dispersed middle-class families and businesses in the city. New London turned to a policy of urban renewal. Urban renewal, which largely took place between 1949 and the early 70s, involved the seizing and demolishing of large sections of private and public land for the purpose of modernizing and improving aging infrastructure. This was done largely through a grant and loan program administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, better known as HUD. In New London, this approach led to the development of the Thames River Apartments, which was conceived as a way to house families, mostly low-income and largely families of color, who were displaced by urban renewal projects and the construction of I-95. Here's day reporter Joanna Vasquez. So the way that Thames River kind of fits into this is because the, they had to raise so many neighborhoods, which were full of diverse eth- ethnic uh, groups, um, a lot of Um, European immigrants, and a significant population of African Americans. Um, In 1960, the city had a 7.8% non-white population, but the Winthrop urban renewal area had somewhere between 15 to 24 black people living in, in that area. So it was a highly diverse, concentrated area, and um, they decided to use this area Um, as their focus for the area that would be renewed. And in order to get the federal funding that the city was seeking for the project, they essentially had to come up with a way to house everyone that was being displaced. And about 125 families were not able to have um, um, housing accommodations. And so that's how um, they thought to create this sort of affordable housing alternative where people could reside that were being displaced and had nowhere else to go. The housing authority at the time really didn't want density in in the property that they chose. Um, They weren't seeking high rises and the redevelopment agency was kind of the one that pushing the need to, you know, go for some high rises because uh, they didn't want to give up more land that was not going to be taxable. Um, They were already losing so much land that was taxable, so kind of pushed for the city council to vote in favor of housing authority remove its requirement to have low density. So that's how the Thames River Apartments came to be. Uh, Some of the first people that lived there, you know, kind of describe the Thames River Apartments as beautiful when it was new. It was was big, but it was beautiful because when I I first moved in, it was a beautiful apartment. And I think it had two or three bedrooms. It was pretty big. Before Eleanor Magalis Hempstead moved into the Thames River Apartments when she was 11, she lived on Pier Street, which disappeared as part of urban renewal development. Yeah, we so together, we, walk to school. Yeah, we all walked to school together. Yep. We went to school, we played it, went through school. Uh, when the lights came on, we had to be in the house. Otherwise, we'd get in trouble. Mm-hmm. The street lights, because we could all go out and stay out until the street lights came on. If we weren't in the house and the street lights came on, we were in trouble. In my family. You know, so that was one of the rules. Yeah. Well, we, we moved into the high rises. There was ten families. Mm-hmm. That was the first original ten families. There was um, the Gomez's, the Potters, the Johnsons, the Jones, the Bloomers, the Crawleys, the Greens. I just had my oh, the Tacklings, and probably two other ones I can't remember. And this place was kind of seen as kind of their new home, right? Because they had lost their home and it was a a solution for the redevelopment agency because they didn't have anywhere else to put these people and a lot of them were low-income families. The original planners didn't expect to have so many um, 
low income units. Um, but that, that was the reality of things and, and they had to accommodate. Their plans changed. After decades of mismanagement and decreased funding, which led to spikes in crime and what many considered substandard living conditions, resulting in a class action lawsuit in 2003. The demolition of the Thames River Apartments was finally completed in April 2020. It's for many people uh, that this, this era in New London's uh, history is coming to an end. This is like a monument to uh, the Winthrop Urban Renewal project that began in the 60s. Uh, for many, uh, many of us in my generation, uh, you know, we've lived with the effects of, of urban renewal and the Winthrop Cove project and the damage that it did to the city in hindsight. The city is still trying to improve itself and it's really striving to kind of regain some of that property that's lost. But at the same time, it's running out of open space for future development. So how did the voucher program impact the lives of those families that remained in the Thames River apartments? The golden ticket to a better life. It's worse. Right. It's a lot worse. And it's like I make more, even when I started making manager pay at this time, the most I was paying it was like three, four hundred dollars. And that's no voucher, nothing. Here I'm paying like six or more for an apartment that's not even worth it. Nikisha Moore, also known as Keisha, is one of about 114 families who received Section 8 vouchers to help them relocate from the Thames River Apartments, locally known as the Crystal Avenue Apartments. The vouchers, what some refer to as golden tickets, allowed them to live anywhere in the U.S. and pay 30% of their monthly adjusted income towards rent. About 100 of those households initially leased homes in New London County, and 93 still have vouchers to the state. So it's like, it's hard. Like, like I said, I'd rather be in Crystal. To deal with what I do through now, I'd rather go back home to Crystal. It'd be easier to maintain. I had actually more storage space in Crystal, and all I had was a two bedroom, and I had more space there than what I have for this three bedroom. But it's like with like the working, gas, insurance. It's like they expect you to make at least 4000 a month just to live comfortably. Well, Keisha, you know, she, she was a prime example of how people moving out of the apartments had a lot more going on in their lives. She found out she was pregnant towards um, in, the middle of, in the middle of the process of moving out, and she lost her fiancé, someone that was supporting her. She struggled finding a place for her and, and um, her child and her grandmother, who she's been taking care of. Yeah, we kind of see how um, a lot of these people had a lot more going on in their lives as things were going down. I was the last one to leave Crystal. Mm -hmm. And it was August of 2018. I was kind of excited because I thought I was going to be better. But I was more aggravated and stressed because we got put in a hotel. Two months before that, I lost my daughter's father while I was pregnant. So it was just, it was just a lot. It was stressful. The last the ending of it was really stressful. For Alba, you know, she's an example that even as you move out and you move into a place that's considered really nice, um, but it kind of lacks that sense of community. Um, she doesn't have a car, so things aren't in within proximity to her anymore. She's away from family. She's always kind of grown up around family, and now her children are struggling to settle into a different, you know, school district. You never know what you have until you start missing it. It's all, you know, all your friends and everything you're going to leave behind, and we're going to be separated, and you're, you're barely going to see them again, because I barely see them. Some of them, I don't even see them. Where's your sister now? My sister, she moved to um, Texas. My mom lives in Norwich. I work for her on her PCA. But um, the, my friends and everything, I haven't seen them. Alba Martinez is now living in a two-story townhouse with her four children. She has looked for ways to return to New London, but hasn't found an apartment that can accommodate her family.
a dearth of affordable housing development in New London. I joke that if I ever had to write a book about real estate development, I would write it about New London. <laughs> Mike Matos is an affordable housing developer who has had trouble finding funding to develop much needed housing in New London. At the same time, there's been a boom in market rate housing developments. As a result, working class, lower income families, often people of color, feel like they're being pushed out of the city. While some in New London were in favor of demolishing the Thames River apartments, in particular during the 90s, citing increase in crime and what some called squalor, another alternative was redevelopment or rehabilitation of the property. That's when Mike Matos and his nonprofit company, Affordable Housing Services Collaborative, come into the picture with a plan to redevelop the property, which was eventually scrapped for a plan to relocate the residents to a new housing development somewhere else in New London. We responded in March of 15 to a request for proposals that the um, New London Housing Authority had issued. Strategically, it was a, for us, we wanted to start to, to do some projects in Connecticut and expand beyond Massachusetts, right? So we looked at this as an opportunity to try to develop affordable housing in a, in a different you know, geographic area, but still expand our mission, because our mission is to create and develop affordable housing. You know, once we got selected, you know, there was a lot of, I think, opposition locally to having the housing be, continue to be at that location. Um, there were um, a lot of folks uh, in town who felt that that was a poor decision of urban renewal back in the 60s, that the housing should never have been put there. It was a bad location for it. And they wanted to see us relocate folks. They wanted to see us, not real, but they wanted to see us build new units somewhere else in the community and you know, and have folks live there instead of at that current site. With that in mind, we said, okay, well, let's start looking around and see what other sites are available to accommodate 124 units. So New London is a very dense uh, city. It's only got, I think it's like five square miles. It's not very large. So there's not a lot of open space that you can just go build 124 units somewhere, right? We really started to look and we evaluated several sites, right? Um, and, you know, all of them had major um, site issues like grading issues that you'd have to bring in still. It would cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it was just like cost prohibitive, you know? And then someone said to us, hey, the old Edgerton School property is going up for auction. The, the Edgerton School property, a 3.3-acre site, had been vacant since it closed in 2009. It was built in 1962 and hosted elementary school students until it closed as part of a consolidation of elementary schools. At various times, it had been the proposed site of a 60,000-square-foot sports complex, a self-storage facility, a city-owned recreational center. And so we looked at that site and we said, oh my God, this is a great location for affordable housing. Like forget, pretend there's no school there. It's a great site. It's got large enough for parking, large enough for housing. You're nestled between, you know, a, a, you know, already a residential neighborhood with, uh, with a municipal playground park next door. So we thought, wow, we, we think this is the site. This would work. We could make this work. At that time, the housing authority was our partner. We had everyone's support. So we thought. So we said, let's do it. We'll make this, we'll, we'll make this, this will work. It's a great site. So we ended up purchasing, we got a, um, a pre-development loan from LISC, which is a, a lender in the affordable housing world. And so we got a pre-development loan, we, we acquired the site. And then we also acquired the homes, because um, I think one of the two of them were up to sale anyway. So we contacted them and said, hey, you know, we're gonna be doing this project, you know, would you be interested? So we ended up doing some land assembly prior to going and doing our permitting. Around that same time, there was a change of the guard over at the housing authority. Um, the director who had we had been working with, she left. The executive director of the New London Housing Authority, Sue Chantel, left the authority in November of 2016, and the board was replaced with mostly new members. They, rather than appointing a new director, they appointed new members of the board. So a lot of the board members who originally selected us with Sue had, were now gone, and the new administration had appointed new members to the to the housing authority. And I feel like when that happened, oh, 
the momentum changed. Everything kind of changed. And at that point in time, I feel like a lot of the board members were like, okay, who are you and what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, we said, you know, we were selected through this RFP process to, to redo this. And they said, yeah, we don't want to really do that anymore. We want to, they, they felt like this needed to be done now. We can't wait for a year or two while you get your permitting and financing in place and start construction. And then a year of construction, like that's three years. Oh, we can't wait that long. Like, we need to do this now. And that was kind of their feeling and their attitude, which I understood. I mean, you know, they, they wanted to try to help the residents and all that. So they they basically said, all right, we're just going to pursue this, and they're going to, you know, uh, move folks out. So we kind of we, we lost that leverage when we lost the housing authority kind of as our partner. And so, but having said that, now we already bought the site. We And we looked at it, we looked at the market and our real estate market, uh, you know, summary that we did. And there was such a strong need for affordable housing in New London and, and in southeastern Connecticut that we felt like, hey, the, there is a market here for this. And we, you know, we should try to, since we already own the site, we should pursue this project and just tweak it a little differently. So therefore, it's not one for one replacement housing now for the famous River site. But we would certainly, when we offered this, is to provide the residents, you know, sort of an option to come live there if they want to. Once it was developed, we were going to try to propose that, you know, folks would have, you know, the kind of like a tenant selection process where they would be given a priority. Ultimately, Mike Matos's company tried for three consecutive years to apply for housing tax credits through the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority and for financing through the State Department of Housing. The project had been scaled back to 72 units and later to a 52-unit mixed-income complex. The state scores applications with a point system for such things as proximity to a transportation hub. For example, the hub would need to be located within half a mile of the complex to gain points. Mato said the Edgerton property is 0.7 miles away from such a facility. They weren't able to generate enough points to competitively get the funding needed. Finally, they sold the Edgerton property earlier this year. This has been a long story for, for, for me. <laughs> and the final chapter was for just recently when we sold the property, you know, Maple, I think it was. It's kind of, uh, you know, bittersweet. I, I Obviously, we wanted the project to work. I personally put a lot of time and effort into it. Our organization put a lot of money into it. Um, we... You know, there was just so many different things that we've, um, in so many different, you know, meetings with, you know, former residents of the Thames River when we first started this process, when the Housing Authority was still fully engaged back in 2015 and, and sort of half of 2016. So for that year and a half period, we were, you know, we were communicating with residents, we were communicating with uh, neighbors, we were, we did a lot of work with them. The and, property which had been proposed as a potential response to the increasing need for affordable housing was sold along with three adjacent parcels. The new owner said he's exploring ideas for the future use of the site, but clarified that housing is not being considered for the former school building. You can support this podcast and the Housing Solutions Lab by making a tax-deductible donation at givebutter.com slash thedayhousing. We want to thank our community donors and our supporting partners, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, the William Casper Graustein Memorial Fund, the Melville Charitable Trust, and the Chelsea Groton Foundation. You can find the housing series at theday.com slash housing lab.